y'all so much. Thank y'all so much. Hey, it is so awesome to be with you guys. Thank y'all, that's, that's plenty. Thank y'all so much. Please be seated. Please be seated. So, so awesome to be with you guys tonight. Thanks for having me and Stephen, you know, not even being here, letting me be here. So I'm the pastor tonight. So anyway, you know, I feel honored to be here. You came out in the rain, but um, you know, you know this, but Pastor Stephen and Erica, they're some great leaders. You are blessed to have a leadership here at Covenant Church. And of course, you know, we've been friends with, you know, Mike, Pastor Mike and Kathy for years, my family, but boy, to see Every time I hear Pastor Stephen, that, that young man has so much incredible insight. He's been on my radio program, and I just turn it over and let him talk and learn. But I, I feel, you know, I know you guys know this, but you're blessed to have them here. So thanks for coming out tonight. Thanks for staying plugged in. Whatever, like Pastor Stephen said, whatever church you go to, plug, stay plugged in. Keep God first place. Life goes better when we put God first. And so... I just, um, I don't have a big speech here tonight. Phil can ask me some questions, but I, I do feel this, that I believe in 2018, God is going to exceed your expectations. I believe he wants to do some new things in your life, some things that you haven't seen happen before, maybe open doors that you couldn't open, or maybe you've had an addiction for years. Well, why don't you believe with me and agree with God that this is your year to break it, or your year to be free from a sickness, or... Maybe you've been single a long time. You're ready to meet someone. Well, you got to be a believer. 2018 is your year. Let's take the limits off of God. You know, God wants to, I never dreamed I'd be here. I guess I'm telling my story. I never dreamed I'd be here, but let me sit down. I'm supposed to be listening to you, Phil, but go ahead. Where are we going to start? Amazing. Hey, it's great to be here, and I also want to welcome our other three campuses, Colleyville and Crossroads and McKinney. Welcome. I know uh, uh, they're observing and enjoying tonight. No, I, I think, Pastor Joe, I, I think about what God has done in your life. Could you have ever imagined this? I mean, yeah. uh, uh, this January will be 20 years. Yeah. You go back even 22, 23 years ago. Could you ever imagine what has happened? No, really, really, I really couldn't have imagined this. If I can go back and take it, I can go off on this a little bit. Well, my, my parents started Lakewood in 1959 with 90 people. My father was a Southern Baptist minister before I was born, and he was doing well in the, in the Baptist church. And, of course, we love the Baptists and different denominations, but he felt like God had put something bigger in him way back in 1959. And my dad was a pioneer. He left that church and started an independent church called Lakewood with 90 people, as I said, in 1959. And they started Lakewood in an old feed store. My dad had just left a beautiful Baptist church, but all they could find was this rundown feed store. And... I wasn't born in 1959, but uh, when, when I did come along, see, I grew up in a small church. Lakewood had less than 200 people for 13 years. Wow. You know, sometimes people see Lakewood, wow, y'all just a big church. Well, it wasn't big when I grew up. I, I sort of knew everybody. But you know what? When I look back over my life and think about things that I think have made an impact, when I was growing up, I saw my father preach to those 90 people like he pre would preach to 90,000 people. Every, every service, he gave it his all. He'd been overseas and had, had um, services with 100,000 people in it. And his friends would come back and say, John, what are you doing, pastor, in this congregation of 90 people? He would say, I'm doing exactly what I feel like God wants me to do. And so for 13 years, the church didn't really grow. And I believe that those 13 years were times of testing and proving in my father's life. You know, the scripture says, if you'll be faithful with the small, God will trust you with much. And you may be in a season, you think, well, I'm doing the right thing, Joel. I'm honoring God. I'm being my best at work. I'm coming to church, but I don't see any growth. I don't see anything happening. You don't know that you're not in a testing season. You just keep doing the right thing, you know, even maybe when you're not seeing the growth or when the wrong thing is happening. Let me tell you, when it's your time to be promoted, nothing can stop God. Promotion comes from the Lord. He'll open up the right doors. And so... Despite my father being his best and not seeing much growth, he just kept doing that faithfully year after year. Well, 1972, it was like somebody turned on a faucet and people would come to Lakewood. It grew really large to, you know, six, 7,000 or even more members than that. Well, anyway, I came along and went to college, came back and, uh, to, to Lakewood to start the television ministry. I worked 17 years behind the scenes at Lakewood doing the production. I loved the lighting and the even here, the screens and everything's so beautiful. I thought that's what I would do with my life. 
But those 17 years behind the scenes, Pastor Phil, my dad tried many times to get me up to minister. He said, Joel, you'd make a good pastor. Why don't you come in and help me, uh, you know, to, to lead the church? But I didn't think this was in me. I'm more quiet and reserved. I like being behind the scenes. And I'd tell him, Daddy, you preach and I'll make you look good, but I won't stay behind the scenes. But I, I didn't think this was in me, but I'll make a longer story short. But my dad was 77 years old. And when he was 77 years old, he had to go on dialysis. His kidneys weren't working real well, but he's still speaking every service, every Sunday at the church. He called me one Monday and he asked if I would speak for him that weekend. I was 36 years old and I had not spoken one time. And when he asked me, he, he never pressured me, but I just kind of laughed and I said, Dad, Daddy, thank you. I'm, I'm honored that you'd asked me, but that's not me. I'm not a preacher. And we hung up the phone, kind of laughed. When I, fit, when I sat down to finish eating my dinner at that time, a couple minutes later, I felt something on the inside so, say so strongly, Joel, you need to do it. And I don't know how to explain it. I just knew that I knew that I was supposed to speak for him that weekend. Well, I picked up the phone, called my dad back, and told him I'd do it. And of course, my siblings, my mom, they nearly passed out. I was going to speak my first sermon in 36 years. I'll be honest, that was the most miserable week of my life. I, I so dreaded having to get up in front of people. You know, if you've ever done public speaking, I just was, I told Victoria, don't speak to me until Sunday afternoon at one o'clock. I'm going to do this one time and get it over with. Well, my dad had to go in the hospital that Friday because there were some complications with the dialysis. And so he couldn't be there on the Sunday. So we hooked him up by the telephone to, to listen. This was in 1999. I got up there in front of 6,000 people. My first thought was, what is, it, what is everybody doing staring at me? I had never seen it from that perspective. And I was so nervous. I felt like I had to hold on to the podium. I did my best. I, I told a bunch of stories about my family. and People loved my parents. They said I did good. I don't know if I did. But when I got finished, I, went, I told Victoria, let's go up to the hospital and see my father. See what he thought. He got to hear me preach my first sermon. The nurses stopped me in the halls. They said, we've never seen your dad so proud. He's just beaming with joy. Well, little did I know that would be the last Sunday of my father's life. That next Friday, he had a heart attack and went to be with, my, went to be with the Lord. Well, my dad, Phil, you know, was like one of my best friends. Traveled the world together. I worked with him every day. And, you know, I thought daddy would live to be 100 years old. You know, he was my hero. Well, if you've ever lost somebody sort of unexpectedly, you know, you're kind of in that fog for a couple of days. I couldn't believe my dad was gone. But a few days later, he died on a Friday night. But that Monday, I felt something down in here say, Joel, you need to step up and pastor the church. Everything in my mind said, Joel, are you crazy? You've spoken one time for your dad. Now you're going to take over his big church. Everything on the inside said, Joe, you don't have the training. You don't have the experience. You've never been to seminary. But I've learned you can talk yourself out of your dreams or you can talk yourself out into your dreams. Uh, so much of it, so much of it is taking place in our mind. What are we allowing to play all the time? I wouldn't be here if I would have let that recording keep playing. Joel, you can't do it. You're not that talented. You don't have the experience. You're not like my dad. I had to turn that off. And I didn't tell anybody except my mom. I said, I'll start speaking for you on some Sundays. But, you know, long story short, we never dreamed the church would grow. We thought if we could maintain what my parents had built, we'd be doing really well. But I look up, you know, 20 years, 19 years later, even being here with you guys tonight and owning the Compact Center now. You know what this tells me? Number one, it tells me God is a faithful God. He was faithful to my dad to let the church to continue. But you know the other thing? It's this. God's dream for your life is much bigger than your own. I didn't think this was in me. There are gifts and talents in you right now that you have not yet tapped into. And I believe in the coming days, you're going to see God open some new doors for you. And you, may, you may feel like I did, not me, Joe. I couldn't step into that. I couldn't teach the class. I couldn't run the business. I couldn't... You know what? God wouldn't have given you that opportunity if he had not already equipped you and empowered you. Those gifts, those talents that you don't know are there, I believe as you step up. I mean, I had to do my, my part. I could have talked myself out of it. There were many Saturday nights. I'd, look in my, I'd have to go look at myself in the mirror because I wasn't going to go Sunday. And I'd say, Joel, you are well able. You can do all things through Christ. You are strong in the Lord. You got to talk to yourself or yourself will talk to you. Wow. Is that good English? I don't know. Yourself. You, you'll talk to yourself. 
Do you know what I mean? You can't let the, and that's, that's sort of what my, that's what my book's all about. But anyway, we'll talk about that later. But anyway, what am I supposed to be talking about? Oh yeah, my story. Yeah, you know, now let me tell you, I'll tell you some principles here. Just some things, just, I know it's random, but hey, nobody's listening, right? Nobody else, is, no, we're not on TV, I should say. But you know, when you go through a loss, as I said, my dad was my best friend, or one of, you know, Victoria's my best friend, but you know, one of my best friends. But I used to think, I used to tell Victoria, what am I going to do when my dad's not here? Because I worked with him every day. I traveled the world with him. We'd go see the Astros play baseball together. We just hung out together. Well, and I always say this very respectfully, but when my dad went to be with the Lord, what I thought would be my darkest hour launched me into my brightest hour. I wouldn't be up here if my dad was still alive. I was comfortable behind the scenes. Sometimes God will use adversity to push you into your destiny. And so I don't think that we have to fight everything that doesn't go our way. Nobody likes to go through a loss. So that's hard. And I'm, saying, I'm not saying you, you, know, you accept um, an addiction or you accept sickness, but I don't believe you have to fight everything. We may not understand it, but we can go back and say, God, I know you're still in control. This loss of my loved one, this loss of a job, this loss of a relationship is not a surprise to you. Now, I've learned if you won't get bitter in times of loss, if you won't, you know, get mad at God or just give up on life or, or, you know, lose your dreams, but if you'll keep moving forward, even if you don't understand it, you know what's going to happen? God will do for you what he did for me. He'll open up some new doors. He'll take you places even further than you might have imagined. So in those times of loss... You know, it's easy to think it could never be as good as it used to be, but you don't know what God has in store. And yes, I still miss my dad, but really that launched me into what I'm doing today. So I encourage you to stay faithful. Another principle there, Phil, going through that, you know, when I look back now, well, you know those 17 years that I worked behind the scenes, every time my dad ministered, I would have to edit his sermon down from 40 minutes to 25 minutes to, for a TV program. We, you know, my dad was on television too, so... I would have to listen to his message maybe four or five times each time to try to figure out what's he saying and where do I need to cut it down? What can I edit? Well, I didn't realize it back then, but God was getting me trained back then for what I'm doing today. I was listening to all those sermons, hearing all those stories, all those scriptures. So you got to know God is getting you prepared right now for some amazing things in your future. You may think like me. You know, no, you know, not me, Joel. I'm just, I'm just doing the TV production. I'm just doing my part. But you don't know what God has in store. And this is why it's easy for me to encourage you because I, I have been to that place where I thought I can't get up in front of people or I'll never be a minister. But let me encourage you. You just keep being your best right where you are. Every day you go to work and you give it your best. You do more than you have to. You come to church. You serve other people. You're good to others. Every day you do that, you are passing the test. You are one day closer for God taking you to even new levels. And I believe like God's did, done in my life, you, where you are is not where you're going to stay. Yeah. Some of you are teaching at that school. You're going to be running the school. Come on. You're working for a business. You're going to be owning a business. There's some new things God has in store. So keep being faithful right where you are. And I know sometimes when people say, well, Joel, nobody's giving me credit at work. Nobody's, you know, they're taking my ideas. Nobody's, you know, they don't see me as significant. Listen, you're not working under people. You're working under God. God is keeping all the records. Again, when it's your time to be promoted, all the forces of darkness cannot stop our God from getting you to where you're supposed to be. One other thing, Phil, and then we'll do two questions. But uh, <laughs> one other thing, you know, I, I think something else that maybe it'll help you just, you know, when my dad went to be with the Lord, he had pastored Lakewood for 40 years. So when I got up there to minister, I thought, I knew everybody that had come was there because of my father, because they'd been there, you know, many of them for years and years. So I naturally thought, hey, I'm the new guy up here, and I got to be like my father. I got to preach like my father. I got to lead like my father. My father used to go down to the office every day and walk up and down the hallways and encourage people, and he'd be the last one. He'd there, he'd turn off the lights, and Victoria would tell me, Joel, you need to go up there like your dad and walk around the hallway. I thought, Victoria, I, I'm going to take me seven days to get my next message. i got to study and prepare. But, but you know, really, seriously, I, I tried to be like my father, and, and, it's, and I still love and respect my father. But when I ministered, I don't know if you've ever seen my dad, but my dad was real fiery. My dad was, had a, you know, real dynamic personality. I'm more laid back, and my dad would always have, or many times would have a long scripture reading at the front to, you know, 
You know, that's the way he'd start his sermon. So I tried to preach like my dad those first few months or so. But at one point, I realized I'm not my dad. I can't be who, who my dad is. I love him and respect him. I realized my gift, my dad was more of a traditional pastor. He would teach the book of Ephesians and the book of the Philippians and things like that. Well, my gift, I realized, was encouraging people, was uplifting them. And I thought, you know what, I'd rather take one little portion of a scripture and, and, and talk about that over and over than feel like I have to read a long scripture reading just so people think I'm scriptural or think I'm spiritual. So I, about six months in Phil, I was, you know, I'd been trying to be like my dad, but I read this scripture in the book of Acts. It said, David fulfilled his purpose for his generation. When I read that, I felt like God said, Joel, your dad fulfilled his purpose. Why don't you go fulfill your purpose? Yeah. It was at that point, you know, at that point, I felt, I felt released. I thought, you know what? I'm going to be who God made me to be. And if it doesn't work out, that's fine. But here's what I've learned. You're not anointed to be anybody else. You're anointed to be you. Can I tell you this? Nobody can beat you at being you. You know what's hard is to pretend, is to be like somebody else. It's hard for me to try to be my dad. And again, I love my dad. It's easy to be me. You know, I'm not a, I'm not a performer. I'm not an entertainer. This is easy tonight. I'm just talking because you know what? You're anointed to be you. That's where the blessing on your life is. And, and I think, Phil, these days, you know, guys, there's so much comparison. You get on social media you feel good about yourself until you see what your friend's doing. You know, there's all this comparison and there's, you know, and just even, even, you know, you want to be who your parents want you to be and you want to be who your boss wants you to be, but always respectfully, but you got to look down on the inside and you got to have a boldness. Your assignment is too important. Your destiny is too great to let somebody squeeze you into what they think you want you, they, what they want you to be. And I, I say it respect, always do it respectfully, but you have to have a boldness to say, God, this is what you put in my heart. I'm going to be who you've called me to be. Yeah. One question, long answer, y'all. I'll do better next time. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. I, I wanted to, you know, a, a lot of credit to, I just want to say this uh, for Lakewood Church, that they were willing to accept you running your lane. And, and this church is, you know, in that same process, you know, one of the greatest pastors in the country, and then transitioning to Pastor Steve, and you've already said it already, uh, the kind of respect that we have for Pastor Steve, and, and the same thing is happening. He's finding his own lane, but the church has been accepting of that, and I, and that, I think that's equally as important. It is, Phil. It's, it's so important. You know, Lakewood was very, lo so loyal, and still are to my mom and dad, and I think part of that loyalty is they accepted me not being my father. And you know, guys, I'm not like Pastor Stephen. When I started, I wasn't that good. You know, I had to grow. I had to learn. And so it was the loyal people of Lakewood, the loyal people of Covenant Church. And that's, that's the beauty of you guys. And you know, you honor your senior, your founding pastors by accepting the next generation. That's what I saw in my own life. Wow, powerful, Joel. Uh, let's talk about the book, uh, uh, next level thinking, you know, uh, one of the great things that you've been able to do is, you know, by God's grace, of course, help so many people, Sirius XM radio, television, 191 nights of hope. How important is the th good thinking, better thinking? I mean, you're, you're answering, you're aware of so many people's problems in life. Why did you write Next Level Thinking? What's well, the value and how important is it for people? Well, Phil, I believe that many times we put limits on ourselves, and it starts on our own, in our own thinking. We all have a recording that's playing in our mind, and psychologists call it an, our internal dialogue. Sometimes it's even said you talk to yourself more than you talk to anybody else. Sometimes we don't realize it, but our recording is negative. It's been negative our whole life sometimes. And it's just thoughts like, you know what, I'm not that talented or I'll never get that promotion. I'll never break this addiction. I'll never get married. I'll never get out of debt. You need to pay attention to what those reoccurring thoughts are. And I think that's, you know, my, my dad always taught us, you will never rise any higher than the way you see yourself. And I believe many times, see, see, when I took over from my dad, well, I already said it, but I didn't see myself as a pastor. I didn't see myself getting up there. I had to change the recording. If I had not done that, I wouldn't be here. So I think it's, um, you know, the, the battle's taking place in our mind. You have to see it on the inside before it can happen on the outside. So I just encourage you to, 
you know, the thoughts that should be playing in our mind are, are things like, it's what God says about us. Let me go through a few of them. I am, I'll say this for all of us. We are blessed. Yeah. Let me do it personal I, for you. I am blessed. I am prosperous. I am talented. I am disciplined, focused, confident, secure, prepared, qualified, motivated, valuable, equipped, empowered. We need to play in our mind what God says about us. Yeah. He said, Joe, I'm not blessed. I'm not talented. I'm not, you know what? You are talented. You may not be some of that right now, but that's what it's all about. As you get in agreement with God, then he can bring blessing. Then he can bring talent. Then he can bring new levels. But how many people today go around with, you know what? I'm just average. I'm just mediocre. Listen, here's what God says about you. You're a masterpiece. Right. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are valuable. You are unique. You are one of a kind. Boy, the difference... The difference in playing that all through the day, other than, you know what, I'm not as talented as Phil, I'm not as attractive as this one. The difference of, of doing that is, is night and day going around, just not better than somebody else, not egotistically, but just getting in agreement with God. Listen, God is the one that made you. And so many times we get labeled by life. We, we, we put labels on ourselves. We fail. We made mistakes. Now that, that, that the accusers, you know, that voice is playing. Well, you look, you know, this be fine for you, but look at the mistakes you've made. Look what you've done wrong. You've got to turn off. Boy, the battle's taking place right here. If you can get your mind going in the right direction, yeah. take the limits off of God. Take the limits off of yourself. God has all power. I think we put limits on ourselves. Yeah. If you'll take them off yourself and say, well, you know what? I may not see how in the natural, but I serve a supernatural God. God, I'm going to agree with you. I am blessed. I am favored. I am yeah. talented. That's what allows new doors to begin to open. It's taking yeah. place in our mind. And fantastic. And so, you know, you've, you've shared 10 powerful principles uh, that help people think better. Uh, the first chapter is uh, very intriguing to me, breaking barriers, because, you know, it motivated me when I read it, Joe, that quite frankly... I need to be motivated for myself, but when I realize that what I do is going to affect the next generation, it awakens even something more in me. Talk to me about this breaking barrier. Yeah, you know, it, it's, again, it's, I can, I've seen it firsthand in my own life. I mentioned my father earlier. Daddy was, uh, was, um, he was, he came out of poverty. He was raised during the Great Depression. His parents and family, they were cotton farmers, and when all the bank closed, they lost everything. Well, my dad, you know, as a little boy and teenager, they didn't have money for food. They'd, you know, water down the milk. And he got the Christmas basket at school as the poorest one in the family. So good people, just very, very poor. And that was, he, he really grew up with a poverty mindset. He felt like that was normal, that everybody struggled. Everybody didn't have enough. Well, my, my dad's family, they didn't know anything about God. They were good people. They just weren't raised in church. They might pray at Christmas or Easter or something like that, but God wasn't a part of their life. Well, just the sovereignty of God. At 17 years of age, my dad was walking home from a nightclub, 2 o'clock in the morning. He began to look up and think about eternity and what he's going to do in his life, with, about purpose and destiny. Really, it was God drawing him. Yes, the, again, the sovereignty of God. Well, he walked in his house at 2 o'clock in the morning. They had a coffee table that had a, a Bible on it, you know, there for decoration. They never looked at it, but it's just a, a decoration. Well, my dad opened the Bible, 17 years of age. It, it fell open to a picture of Jesus standing at a door and knocking. The script caption read, if you, you know, Jesus said, if you open the door and if you knock and open the door, I'll come in. And so my dad said, I couldn't understand religion, but I could understand opening a door. Well, my dad had a friend at high school that had bugged him for months about going to church with him. My dad went to church the next day or that Sunday and gave his life to Christ. My dad felt like right then at 17 that God called him to be a pastor. You know, and, and it was just unusual, wild, wild, out of the blue. But he, he, here's the thing. He told his parents that he was going to leave the farm at 17 and go out and minister. And his parents, of course, they were good people. They loved him. But they said, John, you don't know how to minister. All you know how to do is pick cotton. You're going to get out there and fail. You better stay on the farm with us. And sometimes well-meaning people can try to talk you out of your destiny. And his parents, of course, they didn't mean, you know, they're trying to protect him. But again, you've got to look down in your heart at what God has called you to do. And what I've learned, what God puts in you, somebody else may not see that. A family member, a friend may not see that. But you've you got to be bold enough to not let somebody talk you out of what God put in your heart. 
And my dad, of course, he was respectful, but he left the farm at 17 and went out and started ministry. He didn't have any money. He had to hitchhike. He started speaking in the prisons and the senior citizens' homes anywhere he could. Well, I don't know if you know, my, know of my dad, but my dad went on to live a great life, pastored great churches and touched people all over the world. And really, what, what hit me, Phil, is my dad told me at, at 17 years old, he said, Joel, when, when I gave my life to Christ, he said, I made a decision right there that my children were not going to be raised in the poverty that I was raised in. And so my dad was a pioneer. He took these steps of faith. You know what daddy really did, among many other things? He broke that curse of poverty in our life. Yeah. He was a barrier breaker. And so today, you know what? I wouldn't be here if my father hadn't have broke those barriers. He hadn't been willing to take a step of faith. And my children wouldn't be there where they are. So I believe that all of us in some way can be a barrier breaker. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to just rest on what my father built. I want to go further. Even people, when I first took over, people used to ask me, Joel, do you think you could keep the church going? And I never said this arrogantly, but I'd always tell them in humility, I said, I don't think I can just keep it going. I think we can go further. Yeah. The reason why God wants every generation to increase. He wants you to go further than how you were raised. And so maybe today there are some things in your family line, like my dad with poverty. Well, you know what? You can be the one to break the poverty. Yeah. Maybe there are addictions. You know, have you ever noticed how they can get passed from generation to generation to generation? It's going to happen until somebody rises up and puts a stop to it. What I'm saying is you can be the one. You can be the one to break divorce. You can be the one to break a sickness. It's depression. I mean, you can see. They studies show how it gets passed from generation to generation. Well, it doesn't have to. We can be barrier breakers. Yeah. I think one of the first things is quit telling yourself you can't do it. You can do all things through Christ. You are well able. You are equipped. You are empowered. God is breathing in your direction. You talk about Roger Bannister, and uh, I, I, that's a great illustration because, uh, you know, you show that it's almost like an invisible barrier that once somebody breaks it, and it's a great visual uh, story that you tell in your book that helps people understand what's waiting behind breaking yeah, that I barrier. Yeah, I love that, Phil. I may not have all the statistics exactly right, but y'all know years ago, nobody had ever run a mile in less than four minutes. And so they, it was, it was, you know, they were told nobody could ever break a four-minute mile. Well, back whenever, years ago, this guy named Roger Bannister broke the four-minute mile. Never been done before. Well, again, I don't have the figures exactly, but within a year, 36 other people had broke the barrier. So in a, in a sense, the barrier was in our mind. Once one person broke it, then other people started to think, well, you know what, I can do it too. I think it's the same thing in your family. You know, you, your thoughts can tell you, you could never be out of debt. You could never be a blessing to somebody. You could never live free. You could never live happy. You know what? You break that barrier and your children, your grandchildren, other people in your family can do the same thing. Yeah, beautiful. Speaking of running, I, there's a, a hilarious story in your book about one day when you were out running that I think also is a is a great story to help us understand in a culture where there's a lot of competition. So you like to run. You're out running. I love yeah. the story. Well, I'm trying to think of how, how I used it, Phil, but I think it's, you know, it's important to run your race yeah. and to, to, you know, you're not in competition with anybody else. You're in competition with yourself yeah. to be the best that, that you can be. And I, I think these days, you know, probably always, but even these days, more than ever, when you look at what other people are doing on social media, it's easy to compete with people. And I think it's so important. If you can't celebrate somebody else's success, you'll never get to where they are. Yeah. Instead of being intimidated by people that are ahead of you, be inspired by them. Yeah. You know, let them like iron sharpens iron. Let them sharpen you. But I think sometimes it's easy just to get competitive and we end up running races that we're not supposed to be in. I'm not competing with Pastor Stephen. I'm not competing with anyone else. So anyway, one day I'm out. I, I like to run. I, I used to run more, but I have this two-mile track around my path through the neighborhood. And at one point, there's like a mile straight run that, you know, just cr crossing different streets. And so I saw this guy about maybe a quarter of a mile in front of me. He was an older man. He's in his 70s, but he's about a, that far ahead of, ahead of me. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to race him. I'm going to catch him. I want to race him. I got about a mile before I need to turn. So I took off running faster and faster. You know, I just kind of wanted to have a little competition, something to run for. And 
I was racing. He didn't know we were racing, but I was racing him. But here we go. So I was running and running, man. And I, was, I could tell I was gaining on him. And I was feeling good about myself. And I was gaining on him, man. I was really going at it harder and harder and harder. I finally passed him up. I beat him. And, you know, I felt good about myself. Well, I looked up and I had missed my turn. I was supposed to turn like four blocks back. But I was so busy trying to catch somebody that I wasn't even in a race with that I missed my turn. So I think a lot of times in life, we're trying to outperform somebody that's not even in our race. We're trying to outdress somebody, outdrive them, out. You know what? Run your own race. Be the best that you can be. Recognize. You know, I think competitive is good, but compete with yourself. Let other people, when I see somebody ahead of me, I think, Lord, they inspire me. Lord, you did it for them. Listen, God blessing somebody else doesn't mean God can't bless you. I think sometimes we think God used all their favor on Pastor Hayes. You know, I could never get there. You know what? God is, has unlimited favor. I even think about how in the scripture, you know, remember King Saul? He was, they were singing that song, Saul has killed thousands. Saul was happy. He was the king of Israel. People were celebrating him. But the rest of the song said, and David has killed tens of thousands. Well, at that, moment, at that moment, Saul became jealous. And really, Saul lost the kingdom because he couldn't celebrate that David could kill 10,000 and he was just 1,000. Hey, there's nothing wrong with 1,000. Be who God's made you to be. Be content. You know, always strive to do better, but you're not competing with David. Saul would have just been happy with God made him who, who him to be and not been jealous, not, not tried to run somebody else's race. Then, you know, it would have had a different outcome. But anyway... Yeah. That's my so, big point. Uh, you, uh, well, and, and, and I like this because I think this is, this is where people are dealing with, with their thinking. And, you know, one of the things, you know, don't compete with others. Uh, this is your race. But along the line, critics, uh, now you don't have any critics, but some of us yeah, that's right. <laughs> face criticism, people that, you know, come against us and, and uh, uh, if you were to have criticism, what advice would you uh, give? Because it, it really is. It can, it can really break down uh, your morale. When you, know, you know, it was interesting, Phil, because when I worked behind the scenes, you know, for my dad and just, you know, before I was kind of in the public eye, everybody liked me. But as I, as you know, but anytime God gives you a little notoriety, and it's going to happen for all of you. God's going to promote you to new levels. And you know what? Everybody is not going to be for you. Do you know what I've learned? Everybody can't handle your success. And so you have to be, this was what I had to accept. And it was kind of hard because my personality type is to want people to like me. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll mow your lawn. I'll give you a ride. That's just my personality type. But I had to accept the fact that not everybody was going to accept me. Not everybody was going to like me. And that's okay. You can't reach your destiny with everybody liking you. I can even show you in the scripture, Phil. You think about we wouldn't have salvation. Jesus wouldn't have risen from the dead if Judas had not betrayed him. There are people, now this may sound kind of far out, but there are people that are ordained can I say that? To betray you, to not be for you? Wow. We wouldn't have. How about Joseph's brothers? They threw him into a pit. His own family threw him into a pit. You know the story. 13 years later, Joseph became the prime minister of Egypt. He looked at them and said, you meant this for harm, but God used it for good. God meant it for good. Anyway, you could say, here, here's the thing, you know, and it, it may play with our theology, but those brothers were ordained to throw him into the pit. Again, that's why I don't think you have to fight everything that happens. You can't reach your destiny without people being against you. Jesus didn't. Joseph didn't. So I think sometimes we, you know, we want to fight with our critics or we want to fight with that person at, at work or prove to them who they are, who, who we are. But, you know, it's important. Don't get involved in battles that are not between you and your God-given destiny. We fight way too many battles that are simply distractions. I think about in the scripture who was it? Uh, Nehemiah was rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. There were two guys at the bottom. And you know what they were doing? Criticizing. They were saying, Nehemiah, you don't know what you're doing. They even said, if a fox walks on that wall, it's going to fall down. You know what they were doing? They were trying to bait him into an argument. Bait him into a debate. They were trying to get him to come down off the mountain and come down and fight with him. But you know what Nehemiah did? He ignored them. He recognized two people talking about me down there are not between me and my God-given destiny. 
He just kept running his race. I've, I'll t I can promise you this. The critics cannot keep you from your destiny. As long as you don't let them distract you, as long as you don't let that poison get on the inside. Now for me, and I would encourage you, don't read anything negative about you on social media. You know, don't let that poison get into your spirit. Life is too short to worry about what somebody else thinks about you or what somebody that does, somebody that's never going to like you to poison your spirit. This day is a gift from God. You need your emotional energy to fulfill your dreams, to play with your children, to be the best that you can be. So tune out all the negative. You know, it's not worth letting that get into your spirit. You talk about uh, emotions, uh, which is something that I've, you know, I've, I've been privileged to be, uh, to serve your ministry for now 17 years. And I've learned, uh, you know, emotions, how uh, people can drain and how you have to manage, uh, you know, maybe not the right word, but, you know, uh, it, it takes a lot of emotion to do the right thing. And yet, if we're not careful, a lot of it can be. Yeah, you know, Phil, I th it is. We, we only have so much emotional energy each day. It's not a limited, unlimited supply. It's even like, you know, if this was a glass, was a bottle, but imagine that was your supply for the day. Well, you know, there's, if you have, just imagine you got 10% of emotional energy for worry, and I got 20% I'm holding that grudge, I got 30% that what that person said about me. You look up and, you know, 60% of your emotional energy is for negative things. If you will empty out all that negative, then you can use that emotional energy to be who God's called you to be. So I think, I'm, I'm not saying it very clearly, but it takes a lot of emotional energy to hold a grudge. It takes a lot of emotional energy to sit at work and think about who cut you off in traffic and how that wasn't right. Or to just, you know, think about what a coworker said. Do you realize how many times we wake up in the morning and the first thing we think about is, who hurt us the day before, or what didn't work out, or how I don't want to go to work today. You know what? Life is too short for that. You've got to turn that over. And I, I'm not saying that people don't do you wrong, people don't hurt you. And some of, you know, some people have gone through, through big hurts. But here's what I've learned God will be your vindicator, yeah. God will give you beauty for those ashes. And here, here's the key though you know, as long as you're holding on, you have to let go of the ashes before you can receive the beauty. And I think sometimes we're holding on to the grudge or, you know, if they, they said that about me, you know what? Tune that all out. God's in control of your life. No person, no bad break, no disappointment can keep you from your destiny. You keep being who God's called you to be, and God will get you to where you're supposed to be. Yeah. One of the things that you help in the book and just the, the underlining theme of your ministry is to see for people to see their own value, to see the value that they have. And uh, I know in my life, just, and it's not my father's fault, he was not taught, but we were never really given permission to value ourselves. You know, even in, I was raised in a Christian home, uh, it was almost looked down upon. How important is it? Can we get by with having a bad image and somehow maybe God will help? How important is it that we value who we are? Well, you know, Phil, again, I don't think you can reach your destiny without seeing yourself as a child of the Most High God. Mm. And there are many things in life that try to devalue us from, from mistakes we've made to things people have done to us. And, you know, some people weren't raised in a loving environment. But I believe the key is you can't get your value from people. If you get your value, your approval, your affirmation from them, the problem is people can change their mind. The people can do you wrong. You have to get your value from your heavenly father. When God breathed his life into you, he created you as a masterpiece. You're not lacking. You didn't, you're the right size, the right height, the right nationality. You know, and all those forces that try to tell you otherwise, you've got to tune all that out and say, you know what? God, people may not approve me, but I know you approve me. So I'm going to see myself as a masterpiece. I'm going to see myself as fearfully and wonderfully made. You know, it's, it's back to our mind. You have to tune out stuff. You have to go to your heavenly father and, uh, you know, don't live, um, don't let other people's voices play. People don't determine your destiny. The enemy would love to let what somebody said about you, labels somebody put on you, or sometimes we put labels on ourselves. you know, addicted or failure or all these, you know, you got to take all those labels off. You know what you need to put on? Forgiven, yeah. redeemed, valuable child of the most high God. Fantastic. So I think about, um, you know, how God is just, you know, 
really have done the impossible, you know, facing uh, odds that you could never imagine. Uh, I, I think it's a great story, and I, I want to uh, talk a little bit about just how God gave you that compact center. Uh, and I think the, the, the ideal that, you know, where the church used to be and the, and the whole story. And, and actually, I'd like to kind of interrupt my own uh, question with, uh, I wonder if you'd be willing to tell us a story about your first date that you had, Victoria, and how it kind of ties in with the impossible uh, situation of how Compact Center became a uh, reality. Would that's, you do that for me? I'll put like you on the spot. a loaded question, Phil. Yeah, <laughs> let me tell you about the Compact Center first, and I'll come back to that. I don't want, I'm not going to bore you all. But anyway, let, let me tell you this. God has everything lined up that you need, the right people, the right buildings, the right opportunities. Yeah. So when my dad went to be with the Lord, uh, when we took over, the church started growing. Never dreamed it would grow, and so we needed a larger auditorium. Where we were, Lakewood had an 8,000-seat auditorium, but the roads were real small. It was never designed to be back there in the community, and so we needed another place. Well, my dad had always said that he would never move the church, and so... You know, the problem was the roads weren't big enough to handle a larger auditorium. So I thought, well, I'm not going to move it. We were two miles off the freeway. I thought, we'll just go out to the freeway and find some property. Because I thought, I'm not going to be the new guy coming in moving the church anywhere. Well, we found this 100-acre tract of land. And that's hard to find in, in Houston, like it would probably be in Dallas, too, especially in close. And, you know, everything was going great. We, we started doing some soil samples. We talked to the owner. He said, it's been on the market for 20 years you don't need to write a contract. Go do some preliminary work, and we'll draw up the contract in a little while. Well, we took his word for it, and we started uh, doing some soil samples and some rough drawings. We went to close on the property like three months later. I'll never forget, I got there at 7.45 in the morning. It was an 8 o'clock closing. The secretary walked out and said, I'm sorry, the owner sold the property last night. Well, he had given us his word. He said, it's not been on the market. You don't even need to sign a contract. Man, I went home, and I thought, God... Man, the devil stole our property. That was supposed to be ours. I told Victoria, I was so disappointed. I said, Victoria, man, that was a great piece of property. It was here close. And I'll never forget what she said. She said, Joel, God has something better. I thought, I do not want to hear one of my messages. I'm mad right now. But <laughs> about six months later, about six months later, we found this other piece of property, and I thought it was even better than the one before. I thought, man, God, I see what you were doing. You were saving this property. I promise you the exact thing, same thing happened. We went to close on it, and they sold it out from under us. And I thought, you know what, God, it's all in your hands. But in the natural, those, those closed doors, I thought, I don't see any way for uh, any more property over here by the church. Well, long story short. I went to a friend of mine called and said, Joel, I want to go to dinner with you, lunch about something, talk to you about something. And he came and I thought, what is it? He said, I'll tell you when we get to lunch. Well, we got to lunch and he said, Joel, the Houston Rockets are moving out of the compact center. I think that would be a great auditorium for Lakewood. Well, when he said that, that was just like him saying, you know what, you ought to go by the Empire State Building. You know what I mean? I thought, I said, I told him, I said, um, uh, what was his name? I forgot his name. Anyway, I told him, I said, we don't have the money to do that. That's a $500 million building. He said, Joel, the city only owes $7 million on it. Man, when he said that, something came alive on the inside. And so, you know, long story short, we, I didn't even have to announce. We just, we just showed our interest in it. Then it came out all on the news that Lakewood was interested in the compact center. I didn't even have to announce it to the church. So the church, you know, I wasn't moving it. It just so happened we were interested in it. It's just God making all those crooked places straight. Well, you know, it was the hand of God saving that building. The rockets moved out. Too long a story, but I'll tell you a quick part of it. We needed 10 votes from the city council members. We only had nine. Uh, well, we had, let me tell you this. We had 10 votes out of 15. We needed 10. We had 10. We'd worked three years on it. But two days before the final vote, one of the council members got so much pressure from the other side he decided to be out of town. That way, he wouldn't have to vote against us, but him not being there was a vote against us. You know, it's just the pressure in politics. And so, three years we had worked. I went down to City Hall every other day to talk to council members and show them what Lakewood would be. Finally got there, and I thought, man, God, here it is, a closed door, or it doesn't look like it's gonna work out. Well, a day later, you know, 24 hours before the main vote, I called that council, I went to see the council member. He said, Joel, I changed my mind. I'm gonna vote for you. I couldn't get him to change his mind in three years. A young Jewish council member. 
I said, Mark, what was it? What changed your mind? He said, it wasn't you. You were persuasive, but you didn't do it. He said, I got a call last night from an older Jewish lady that I haven't spoken to in over 20 years, but I grew up with her family and I've always had a great respect with her, for her. She told me in no uncertain terms, I was to vote for Lakewood having the compact center. So it was this older Jewish lady that I never met that convinced this young Jewish council member, he voted for us and we got the compact center. What am I saying? God has the right people lined up for you. He can make things happen that you couldn't make happen. Quit worrying about the right spouse, the right house, the right promotion. God is in control. My encouragement is to honor God with your life. Keep him first place. You'll be surprised at where God will take you. You still want me to tell that other story? I'll make it quick. So, so. It's a cool story. Okay, so I, I was in my early 20s, and I had never really dated anybody before. I grew up playing sports, and I was still in my 20s. I was playing baseball five nights a week and tournaments on the weekend. And I thought, God, I'm tired of hanging out with all these guys. I need to find me a woman. Well, I went into a jewelry store to buy a battery for my watch and out walked the most beautiful girl I'd ever seen to wait on me. It was Victoria, her mother's jewelry store. I went in there to buy a battery for my watch. She ended up selling me a whole new watch. She's been taking my money ever since then. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm there, I'm there in the jewelry store. And man, I, th- I thought that girl, Johnny was with me here. And I thought that girl is so beautiful. And I found out she's a good Christian girl. Well, long story short, I called her a couple weeks later. Got my nerve up. I asked her to go out on a date with me. The first date I asked her to go to was to a Rockets basketball game at the Compact Center where I had season tickets. We own the Compact Center now. Well, I had season tickets there. And man, I had, like I said, I had not really dated anybody. So man, the, the big game, the big day rolled around. The Rockets, it was a playoff game. And I was going to, about to go pick her up. I got my car washed. I bought me a new shirt. I wanted everything to go perfect. <laughs> I went to my drawer to get the tickets for that night. I had season tickets. I could find every night except that night. And I suddenly realized I had given those tickets away a few months earlier to a friend of mine. And, you know, they were playing the Lakers. It was sold out. And I thought, wow, what a way to start my first date. Well, anyway, I picked her up and I said, Victoria, I didn't even know her. But I said, I gave my tickets away, but we'll have to buy some from the scalpers out front. That's when it was legal. It's not legal now. But uh, so I went and bought these two tickets. And, of course, the guy told me they were great seats. And we went in. We went in. She went in the turnstile. I gave my ticket to go in the turnstile and uh, the lady stopped me and said, I'm sorry, this ticket is for tomorrow night's game. (laughs) So Victoria was in the building. I was outside the building. All I could do was way better. There's nothing I could do. I went back. I told the guy, you sold me two different nights. He said, okay, here's some tickets. These are good too. They weren't good. They were all the way like at the end zone, at the very end, next row to the top of the auditorium. I mean, I was embarrassed. I was, I was, my seats were on the fourth row. I wanted to impress her. Well, anyway, at halftime, they chose somebody from the stands to shoot a basket from half court. If you made it, you won a car. They chose somebody for our, from our section. So at halftime, the guy goes down, he shoots the basket from half court, and he swishes it. He wins a car. Well, all of his friends are sitting around us. When he made the basket, they jumped up, threw both hands up in the air. The only problem is they all had cups of beer with no lids on them. That beer went up in the air. It was like slow motion. I had time to pray. I said, God, please don't let that beer come down on Victoria. I said, God, I'll go to India and be a missionary. I'll do anything. But you know, God has a sense of humor. The beer missed everybody except Victoria. (laughs) I will never forget beer coming down her blonde hair, her forehead, down her... I'm a preacher's kid. I had to take her back home to her mom smelling like beer. But anyway, (laughs) that's our first date. We've dated for a year and a half. We have two children. Jonathan's 24. He graduated from UT, and he's home with us now working as a creative director and one of our music ministers as well. Alexandra's in school, and we've been married 31 years, and... Let me tell you this. I'll tell you one more thing. I didn't come here to bore y'all about my story, but anyway, I'm giving it to you. Let me tell you this. I wouldn't be half of who I am if it was not for Victoria. She has spoken so many seeds of faith into me. Ten years before my dad went to be with the Lord, we would sit on the front row 
on Sunday nights when I wasn't up in the TV area and my dad would be up ministering, she would nudge me and say, Joel, one day you're going to pastor the church. And that would make me mad. I'd say, Victoria, I am not going to pastor. I don't even know how to preach. She'd say, oh yeah, just preach to them like you preach to me. <laughs> but I want to tell you, I am serious. I had heard her tell me so many times that I could pastor the church. I believe when my dad suddenly died, that's one reason that I could step up. I believe it's a great principle. You have to call out the seeds of greatness in the people God has put in your life. Sometimes you can see things in people that they can't see in themselves. I didn't see that in me. I thought, what does she mean I'm going to pastor? Well, you know, your friends, your, your spouse, your children, they have enough things in life pushing them down. Why don't you be the one to push them up? Why don't you tell them what they can become? Many times you can see things in them that they can't see in themselves. And I've learned when you help somebody else rise higher, God will always help you rise higher. Last thing, and I promise I'm going to quit. A blessing is not a blessing until it's spoken. My thoughts don't bless anybody. You know, I can think, wow, you know, Stephen's a great minister. Or you sure look nice tonight. Or you did great on that project. Those thoughts aren't blessing anybody. You have to verbalize it. Why don't you speak it out? Why don't you send them a text? Why don't you tell them, hey, you're great at that, or that was a beautiful presentation, or you look good today. Whatever it is, speak life and hope, and you know, especially when you can see things in others. That, that your, God can use your words to help them step into their destiny. That's what God did with, with me and Victoria. Fantastic, beautiful. Uh, in just a few moments, we're, uh, uh, I want you to pray. And in one of the chapters, you talk about shame, and I just want you to pray that off of the people. But I want to say, first of all, uh, how grateful we are to Covenant Church for letting us come. You know, Pastor Joe, when, when he writes a book, you know, we go into bookstores and try to make them available. And for Pastor Steve to, uh, and for us to come here, to be in an environment where you know, Pastor Joe has been able to just share his life and his story and then to pray for you. I just think is uh, fantastic. And I just want to say to Pastor Steve and Erica uh, and the host staff, thank you for letting us come. And uh, we love Covenant Church. And it's, it's a beautiful thing, isn't it, to be able to come yeah, to this church? thanks for reminding me, Phil. Yeah, thank you so much. And Pastor Stephen and Pastor Mike, the whole team have been... Uh, They've been friends th through the years, and they've been so supportive of our Nights of Hope. So all of you that, that attend here at Covenant, you have been a big part in what we're doing. So thanks for sowing the seeds, and just uh, thank you to your generous pastors as well. And we just pray blessings on you guys. We're all in this together. We just happen to be in Houston. You're in Dallas, but we're all in. Well, it's a big family. So I'm a... I'm a local pastor, you know, I do other stuff, but I'm a local pastor as well. And, you know, I just, uh, my dream, and Phil, you've helped me to do this, is to connect with other great pastors across the United States. Because most of the people that watch us on television, at least 50%, they don't go to church. They're not religious. They tell me, Joel, I, I, I'm not religious. I wasn't raised in church, but I watch you. Well, that's, that was my goal always, to get outside the church walls. But I realize you can't. Dis, you can't disciple everybody in a 30-minute television program. So that's why at the end of every program, after they pray that prayer of salvation, I tell them, get into a good Bible-based church. They go to the website, and what do they see in Dallas? Churches like Covenant and other churches. So our goal is to throw that wide net of hope and then get them plugged into great pastors and great churches like Covenant. So thanks for being a part, and thanks for all your support. Yeah, amen. Beautiful. We do. And I would just say... That's uh, the responsibility that I get to play, and that is uh, connecting churches. And really, Covenant Church has become one of our biggest uh, supporters, and we're able to go into television and, and not do it the way others have to do it, but we're able to do it with a, a wide net of hope because of churches like you that help us. And so we thank you for that. So, uh, wow, this has been fantastic just to, uh, to be with you, Pastor Joel. And I know that uh, this is for the Arcolaville and uh, make sure I get it right, uh, Crossroads and McKinney audiences. Thank you. And in just a moment, I'm going to ask Pastor to just pray. And uh, tonight, I just want to thank you. And I just encourage you, uh, one of the things we wanted to do is just make this book as accessible and easy uh, for you. And as Pastor Joe, we came a little early, and he's already signed these books. And so those of you that get a book, we're, uh, he, he certainly wants to shake your hand and uh, thank you, and it'll be a great opportunity. But before that happens, Joe, I just want you to pray uh, for everyone.
that's yeah. watching and uh, just release that favor and blessing. I would that, love uh, to. Yeah. Thanks again. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to be with friends here at Covenant and those in the other campuses. Lord, I thank you that you have us all in the palm of your hand, that nothing we're facing tonight is a surprise to you. So, Father, we thank you tonight that, uh, as you've done for my family, just that you would heal those that are fighting sicknesses and diseases. Lord, I thank you that healing and wholeness is flowing into all those that need it. Lord, not just physically, but I lift up those that have been through hurts and unfair situations, maybe even loss. Lord, you said you're close to the brokenhearted. So, Lord, I ask that they'd feel your presence and power right now. Comfort them. Let them know there are new beginnings up ahead. I just speak fresh vision into them. Lord, I, I thank you that you're opening up new doors. And, Lord, even, even situations that we haven't understood in the past. Lord, we turn it over to you right now. We know you are in control, that you will get us to where we're supposed to be. Lord, I ask for all of us that you would give us wisdom to make great decisions. Lord, open the right doors. Close the wrong doors. Bring the right people across our path. And Lord, weed out those that should not be there. Help us to make decisions that honor you and move you toward our God-given destiny. Lord, I thank you that we will not be at this same place next year as we are right now, but we are moving forward. Lord, we're taking limits off of you. I thank you tonight that every force that is trying to stop us is being broken right now in the name of Jesus. The addictions... The loneliness, the lack, sicknesses, whatever it may be, legal problems, relationship issues. Lord, I thank you for a breakthrough night tonight, that you're doing a new thing. And Lord, I want to thank you that the gifts and talents you placed in your people will come out to the full. I thank you for a new boldness, a new confidence. Lord, opening doors that no man can shut, taking them where they could not go on their own. Lord, you've done it for me, and I thank you that you will do it for them as well. We pray blessings upon all the covenant family. Lord, upon Pastor Stephen and Erica and all the leadership team. Lord, I just thank you for health and wholeness and ideas and creativity, resources. We speak your blessings over this church and this family. So I declare for all of us, we are strong. We are healthy. We are blessed, prosperous, redeemed, forgiven, talented, creative, disciplined, focused, confident, secure, prepared, qualified, motivated, valuable, free, equipped, empowered, anointed, accepted, and approved. Not average, not mediocre, but children of the Most High God. Victors and never victims in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless y'all. Amen.